Should we wait maybe one more minute? Uh, just to clarify one thing, uh, Nicholas, uh, I mean, when we are in the discussion period, you're going to monitor the chat, right? Yep. yep. Is that it? So that, I mean, you would sort of come in with, with those kinds of things. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, those who are um, watching us uh, on this webinar and those who are watching us on uh, YouTube. Uh, my name is Nicholas Prevelakis. I'm with the Center for Hellenic Studies. Uh, this is one more uh, event in the um, Philosophy and Ideas series uh, talks, but it's a special event. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the Center for Hellenic Studies, as well as by the Greek uh, Embassy in the United States and the FXB uh, Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. It's not a Zoom as, as the, our previous events, it's a webinar. Uh, so please, if you have uh, questions, uh, make sure to put them in the Q&A uh, and uh, I'll make sure to uh, bring them uh, to the attention uh, of uh, the panelists. Uh, the theme uh, of this uh, conversation is medical ethics from antiquity to the current pandemic. The current pandemic has brought to the fore multiple questions of uh, medical ethics, such as, uh, priority in access to masks and treatments, uh, mask mandates and their permissibility, vaccination mandates, uh, treatments, available treatments, uh, and how much tests should be done before administering them. Uh, and in these debates, many references, uh, explicit references to the uh, Hippocratic Oath. I'll give two examples. One, a New York Times uh, article explaining how uh, doctors had faced dilemmas uh, when parents asked them to delay vaccination vaccinations to their children, and then they were confronted with this principle of do no harm, uh, and then having to ask what makes more harm, um, forcing them to do the vaccinations early and then running the risks of the parents refusing vaccination altogether or accepting the wish of the parents, uh, and then um, many and many other ones which we'll discuss uh, later in the discussion. Uh, it is significant then uh, in 2022, uh, doctors still were, uh, swear by the uh, Hippocratic uh, uh, Oath. Uh, we would like to examine in this panel, what is the Hippocratic Corpus? What is the Hippocratic Oath? What does it say about medical ethics in antiquity? How can this uh, inform current debates? Uh, what does the, um, why does the Hippocratic Oath still serve as reference uh, now? And as we do that, we will address contemporary dilemmas. We have uh, with us, uh, First of all, uh, Her uh, Excellency uh, Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou, the Ambassador of Greece to the United States, who will start with uh, a short uh, welcome. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a presentation by Mark Shevsky, uh, Silois P. Grove Professor of the Classics at Harvard, Director of the Center for Hellenic Studies, and a specialist of ancient medicine, and especially the Hippocratic Corpus. Uh, joining him will be uh, Richard Cash, a Senior Lecturer on Global Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, who has done extensive work on cholera, diarrhea, tuberculosis in such in all over the world, including Japan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, and India, in efforts to eradicate uh, these uh, uh, diseases from all over the world. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, a dear colleague and friend, uh, Natalia Linos, uh, who's uh, acting director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, a social epidemiologist herself, and a person who works extensively today uh, on issues uh, related to climate change and systemic racism uh, and how they affect uh, public health. Without further ado, I'll give the floor to Ambassador Papadopoulou for a few remarks and thank you all for attending. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody to this fascinating and timely, if not overdue discussion on medical ethics that were brought to the forefront by the global COVID pandemic. It is an honor for us at the Embassy of Greece in the United States to be partnering with Harvard FXP Center for Healthy and Human Rights and the Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies to ponder and reflect upon these last two challenging years during which the devastating COVID pandemic has wreaked havoc with our lives, causing us to ask difficult questions and make hard decisions. There is no doubt that our experience with the COVID pandemic has brought us face to face with our fears, calling upon all of us, including political leaders and policymakers, to make difficult, even life or death decisions. 
The pandemic has also shaken up our ethical principles, often challenging them to their very core. As we're hopefully on our way out of this difficult stage, we're left with the memories of these last two years. The lockdowns, the scarcity of medical equipment, the difficult dilemmas in which policymakers and we as individuals found themselves. In the midst of this, especially doctors found themselves confronted with questions as prioritization of care, the protocols for administering new treatments and vaccinations, and the role of the doctor in advising public policy. During this time, we also realized how much public policy, especially public health policy, relies on difficult political and ethical decisions. Whether it comes to decisions about lockdowns, mass vaccinations, uh, or who should get priority access to healthcare in emergency situations, among many other issues, medical expertise alone cannot provide answers. What are the main ethical dilemmas faced by the medical profession today? And how do advances in technology affect the ethics of medical care? This discussion will examine these questions today with the help of specialists in the field of medicine and bioethics. And as we often do at such times of difficulty, we seek comfort in the classics and the thinkers of the past. At this discussion, we look at the Hippocratic Corpus, one of the central and most influential collection of works in the history of medicine, written at a time when medical and ethical questions were seen as intertwined, intrinsically intertwined. For the Embassy of Greece, a co-organizer and co-sponsor of this event, this is one more way to highlight the relevance of classics, of fundamental themes on the relationship between medicine and ethics raised already in the Hippocratic Corpus and see how, if some of the answers of the time seem outdated, the questions behind them are not. We're joined today by Dr. Mark Shevsky, professor of the classics and a specialist of ancient medicine. Dr. Natalia Linos, acting director of the FXP Center for Health and Human Rights, and Dr. Richard Cash, senior lecturer of, on global health of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, to reflect on these questions from a broad and historical perspective. I would like to thank Harvard's FXP Center for Health and Human Rights, as well as the Harvard Center of Hellenic Studies. It is the collaboration of these three institutions that made this fascinating event today possible. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to express my appreciation to Dr. Nicholas Prevelakis of Harvard University for his definitive role in bringing about this truly relevant discussion, which I'm sure everyone will enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And now the floor is uh, Mark Zewski. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ambassador Papadopoulou, and thank you um, also to the, um, to the FXB and, and to the Embassy for co-sponsoring this, um, this event. It's a great pleasure to be participating uh, today. And um, part of the mission of the Center for Hellenic Studies, of which I'm the director, um, is to explore ways in which ancient Greek culture and thought can inform contemporary debates. And that's what we're trying to do in this, um, in this panel um, today. Uh, there really um, is, I think, no better example of that um, than the Hippocratic Oath, um, which is a text that has played a role in shaping medical practice in different cultures um, over many, uh, many centuries. Um, indeed, as uh, Nicholas Prevalak has mentioned, uh, even today, uh, some form of oath taking is involved in medical education, uh, typically uh, to mark the medical student's transition to full fledged uh, membership in the professional community. But there are many other ways in which the Hippocratic Oath figures in modern medical debates. Uh, Nicholas mentioned the, uh, the New York Times um, uh, op ed, um, which is a, a reference to that. Um, there are connections with uh, the abortion debate, since the Hippocratic Oath says um, something about abortive uh, remedies um, and when they should be applied or, or not. So uh, there are many areas of intersection with contemporary debates. And one issue, um, really, then, uh, the core issue for me um, as, a, as a classicist, historian of medicine, and, and scholar of, uh, of ancient medicine, is what does the Hippocratic Oath um, really have to say that is relevant to modern medical ethics? 
And I should say, there are many things that are quite mysterious about the, uh, the Hippocratic Oath, many things that are unfamiliar when one peels back the layers and looks at the original document. Um, it was uh, transmitted in the collection of works attributed to the doctor Hippocrates, who was a real person who practiced medicine in the classical Greek world of the fifth um, century uh, BCE. Uh, we do not, however, know uh, whether Hippocrates authored um, the oath or any, in fact, of uh, the other works that are traditionally attributed to him in this collection of some 60 works uh, that is known as the Hippocratic Corpus. What we have um, in those uh, very precious works is a record of the medical com community of the fifth and fourth centuries uh, BCE, how they thought about uh, therapy, how they thought about ethics, um, how they reflected on the kinds of cures um, that they could administer, whether they would be helpful, whether they would be harmful, and so on and, and so forth. So our texts uh, span a very wide range of uh, technical medical procedures and also um, more general uh, reflections on the limits of medicine, the applicability of medicine, uh, and so on and, uh, and so forth. It's a very rich uh, corpus of material. And the Hippocratic Oath represents um, one um, very small part of that large corpus. It is approximately a page of Greek, um, a few hundred words at most, very brief. Um, and um, we don't know uh, precisely the date, um, probably uh, the fourth century um, BCE, and we don't know uh, the details of the context um, in which it originally circulated. Presumably its function in uh, the medicine of that time was similar to um, the versions of the Hippocratic Oath that are invoked today in medical education. That is to say it was um, a kind of marker of the transition of the student to the full-fledged membership in the professional community. By swearing the oath, uh, somebody is asserting their identity as a medical uh, professional, setting themselves in a long tradition of medical uh, practitioners, past, uh, present, and indeed, uh, to some extent, um, future. So what I want to suggest in just a very few minutes I'm going to put up a slide that has um, five um, key uh, statements from the Hippocratic Oath. Um, what I want to suggest is uh, something about how we should interpret the significance of this uh, document and to argue that it's, it's less in specific um, prohibitions that it makes on questions such as abortion, um, assisted suicide, um, and, um, and the like. Um, and much more on the general attitude and, and framework uh, that it suggests for thinking about um, medical ethics and its, um, and its uh, importance in, um, in medicine. So I wanna illustrate this, and I think the simplest way is, is simply to share a um, screenshot of these five key um, themes. Uh, let me see, I've now... Um, unfortunately lost the screen myself. Um, are people able to see my, uh, the, five, um, the five points? Okay, um, in that case, uh, these are um, five statements uh, from the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, there isn't much more of it, but there is, um, that there is some, which um, um, in fact is not uh, something I'm gonna talk about um, in my few minutes, but I wanna begin um, with um, the, um, the first um, of these. And let me just read out the, um, the, the translation. Um, I swear by Apollo physician and Asclepius and Hygieia and Panakea and all the gods and goddesses, making them my witnesses that I will fulfill according to my ability and judgment, this oath and this covenant. Now, um, the oath, um, as we can see from this um, opening statement, is an expression of a deeply personal commitment um, on the part of the oath taker. The first person singular pronoun, I swear, uh, is in fact used throughout um, the document. It's the first, um, the first words here. The relevant analogy is with um, a solemn and binding treaty. Um, that's another context in which we find those in ancient Greek um, society. So this is an expression of binding commitment on the part of the person who, who swears it. Often in modern versions of, of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, this is watered down um, extensively. Of course, the references to these particular gods 
are not present. Um, some other divinity is, um, is sometimes um, included or the reference to the gods is, is eliminated completely. But uh, the gods play a very important role um, in this um, ancient Greek uh, document. Of course, uh, invoking the gods as witnesses is a way of stressing that there's no way to avoid accountability for one's actions. Uh, the gods see everything. Uh, you're not going to escape uh, Apollo's notice if you um, go into medical practice with the wrong um, attitudes, um, whatever you may do uh, in your external behavior. So there's a deeply internal kind of aspect uh, to the morality that is established by this uh, divine um, framework. And of course, the specific divinities that are mentioned here in this document are uh, divinities of healing. Um, Apollo, who was the father of Asclepius, whose children are Hugieia and Panakea, uh, Hugieia health, uh, Panakea all cure, uh, different dimensions of the healing art, um, say the prevention of disease in Hugieia, um, the cure of disease in Panakea, and Asclepius, of course, the uh, patron uh, divinity of ancient Greek um, medical practice. So there's an attempt in this document to represent the entire past tradition of medical practice uh, as it's represented on the divine um, level and to engage that in the oath taker's um, very personal, uh, personal commitment. So this notion of personal commitment and fidelity really to the art of medicine, because that's what these divinities represent, is an important idea uh, that I think we can recapture uh, from the ancient Hippocratic Oath, looking at it um, in its um, original uh, formulation. So um, let me move on to the second of these um, passages. Uh, I will apply dietetic measures for the benefit of the sick, according to my ability and judgment. I will keep them from harm and injustice. And this is the uh, clause that Nicholas referred to earlier, apropos of the New York Times um, article. Uh, notice that uh, it does not say first uh, do no harm. That is not the formulation that is found here, although it does say um, avoid um, harm. Uh, that formulation, first do no harm, which has been transmitted um, through the ages as um, a sort of pearl of Hippocratic wisdom, is found in some of the other Hippocratic uh, texts, but it is not here um, in, in the oath. Rather, what this clause expresses is the idea, I think quite clearly, that um, medicine is not a value neutral uh, form of technical expertise. I will apply dietetic measures for the benefit of the sick, according to my ability and judgment, I will keep them from harm and injustice. So the doctor um, is not meant um, to um, use cures, which will not be helpful to uh, the sick. And certainly uh, the doctor should not apply cures in ways that are unjust. Now, the text does not tell us uh, what is beneficial. Uh, it does not tell us what is just and what is unjust but it encourages us to reflect on these concepts. Whose benefit indeed uh, is at stake here? Is it the patient's benefit? Is it the benefit of the society as a whole? Does the patient herself or himself get to define what is beneficial? Or is it some sort of objective good that the physician is meant to bring about? The oath does not tell us uh, the answers to those questions, but it does pose the questions and serve as a framework for reflecting on them in the context of this deep uh, personal commitment to um, the ideals of the medical art. So in its rejection of the idea that medicine is a, is a sort of value neutral uh, technical expertise, uh, the oath, in fact, uh, takes a stand against um, a conception of technology that was indeed in the air in the fifth century, in the fourth century uh, BCE. Um, the Greeks of that period uh, knew uh, something that they identified as technology. They knew about mechanical inventions. Um, they knew about various technical improvements. And there was a debate about whether these things are harmful or helpful. And the idea that they're value neutral, uh, they can be used for good or for ill, um, is, is certainly found in Greek thought of the period. But medicine, according to the Hippocratic Oath, is not um, like that. It is not something that um, one can simply consider in abstraction from these ethical values. So that is something that is quite clearly uh, affirmed here 
by the um, Hippocratic Oath. Doctors cannot avoid applying their judgment. Note the term judgment here that is quite uh, emphatic in, in the oath, uh, their judgment on these questions of, um, of ethics. Now, the third uh, clause that I want to put before you very briefly is the famous clause about abortion and perhaps uh, assisted suicide. I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody if asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. So the first of these clauses, um, I will ne neither give a deadly drug to anybody if asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect, is often understood as a prohibition on assisted uh, suicide. Uh, the second um, as a uh, general prohibition on abortion, and that's indeed the way it looks. Uh, similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. Um, and these are, of course, striking features, which, as I said, have been invoked. Um, the Hippocratic Oath is discussed in the Roe v. Wade case, um, the, the write-up um, of the case by the Supreme Court. Um, so it's, it's important to be clear about what we know about what these passages mean and, and what we don't know. Um, the interpretation of the first clause as talking about assisted suicide is not, um, is not entirely clear. Uh, potentially, uh, what is being said here is simply that doctors are not supposed to supply poisons uh, to people, um, deadly drugs, uh, for whatever purpose. Again, the person whose benefit is in question is not, um, is not uh, specified. It may refer to assisted suicide indeed, but it, it also is formulated at least in a way that uh, potentially gives it more general um, significance. And of course, the ancient doctors knew quite a bit about drugs and which ones could kill you just as well as they knew about which ones could, um, could help. Um, as for the abortion um, reference here, uh, in fact, this uh, translation that I give you, which is the translation of the great uh, historian of medicine and classicist uh, Ludwig Edelstein, is slightly misleading uh, because the word remedy is um, a bit too general. In fact, the word remedy uh, is translating the Greek word peson, uh, which should be translated as pessary. That means a vaginal insert uh, that was um, coated with some substance that was thought to bring about an abortion. So the reason that that's important is that it may be the health of the mother that is at stake um, in this clause, rather than the survival of the fetus, because those kinds of vaginal inserts were recognized to be particularly dangerous, uh, dangerous kinds of ways of provoking abortion. Uh, abortion in the ancient world, of course, has a very long history and it was uh, practiced um, extensively. Um, on the other hand, what we have here may be a recommendation to avoid a particularly dangerous form of abortive remedy uh, that could harm the mother um, as much as it would harm the fetus. So uh, we should be very careful about taking this as a blanket uh, prohibition on abortion out of some sense that, for example, life is sacred or, or what have you. That, that, is, not, um, that is not clear uh, in, uh, in this uh, document. So that's one of, the, um, one of the puzzles of the oath. Uh, that we um, may never um, truly be able to, uh, to resolve. Uh, let me move on to just two more uh, quick clauses. Um, uh, the fourth one, in purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. Um, about this, I would just note that these concepts of, of purity and, and holiness, which indeed um, echo the religious, uh, the religious dimension of, of the oath, which is mentioned at the beginning and frames the entire document. Um, these refer um, again to uh, internal attitudes and uh, intentions as much as they do to external behavior. So um, it's not that um, they're simply recommending certain kinds of ritual purity, avoiding impure substances or context. Uh, they also require a certain attitude of mind that I think one could fairly describe as a kind of integrity. Uh, a kind of honesty, a kind of forthrightness, and uh, recognition of the limits of medicine vis-a-vis um, -vis the gods. Um, holiness or piety was often thought of as um, the correct attitude 
towards matters divine, a recognition of um, human limits and um, the reach of divine power. So all of those ideas are operative, but note also, I will guard my life and my art in purity and holiness. There is an overlap, um, indeed perhaps an identity uh, between professional and personal ethics um, here, my life and my art. Uh, the word art um, is a translation of the Greek word techne, which is indeed the term that is used for the medical profession. But uh, here, uh, the person swearing this oath um, is enjoined to uh, observe these principles of behavior and these, these mental attitudes, um, both in their life and in their art. Um, it's not that you should adopt a different persona when you're practicing medicine from the one that you adopt um, when you're a person, or put another way, you can't really be a good doctor without being a good person. I think that is um, one way of uh, interpreting um, this overlap between life and art as we find it um, in uh, the oath. And that um, overlap is indeed echoed again in the fifth and final of these um, clauses. If I fulfill this oath and do not violate it, uh, may it be granted to me to enjoy life and art, that same overlap, being honored with fame among men for all time to come. If I transgress it and swear falsely, may the opposite of all this be my lot. So uh, there's a great deal of accountability here in this uh, statement. And indeed the accountability is, is towards the medical art um, and the fulfillment of the oath, the use of judgment um, according to one's ability in the way that it has been uh, previously specified. Reputation, being honored with fame among all men uh, for all time to come, this reputation depends on one's um, fulfillment of the oath, does not depend on um, external achievements, on how many prizes you get, on whether your colleagues um, think highly of you, on whether your patients think highly of you. It is whether you have acted um, in the correct um, moral and technical way in your medical practice. So that ideal, is I think something that is um, indeed uh, worth uh, recovering um, from this document and capturing in terms of our current um, medical um, ethical uh, dilemmas and, uh, and debates. And I think that that, that kind of ideal is um, what explains uh, largely the, uh, the historical legacy of this document, why people have been um, attracted to something like this statement of principles um, over, the, um, over the centuries. So um, that's all that I will say about the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, just tried to uh, bring out uh, the key features that I think we can uh, take with us for our discussion. I look forward now to the rest of the uh, discussion. We'll stop my screen share. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Mark. And without uh, any transition, I uh, want to ask uh, Richard if you have any um, general comments. Uh, yes, thanks very much. That was a, a very uh, nice rendering of an oath that I took many years ago, many, many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I would certainly agree that it tends to focus on uh, your values as a, a member of the profession and uh, your integrity, things of that nature. I think with all oaths or uh, something particularly dealing with ethics, ethics changes uh, dramatically over time. Uh, we like to think that it's a constant, but it is not. And things continue to appear uh, in our own professional life and so on, which, uh, uh, which uh, causes us or leads us to reevaluate some of the ethical ideas that we have. My own reading, of course, uh, and I am no scholar of this, is that it is very much uh, more focused on the individual and the responsible ability of the individual uh, to other individuals. Uh, at one point he says, this is what I will do for uh, uh, the benefit of the sick. Now, in a lot of what we do in public health, of course, is we're not dealing with the sick we are dealing with people who are normal, who we wanna prevent from being sick. So giving vaccinations, for example, is not uh, uh, administering to someone who is sick, but rather administering to someone who's well, who we want to prevent from being sick. And uh, much of the uh, oath taking, whether it's Maimonides or 
or uh, uh, the Hippocratic Oath or various versions of it and so on, tend to focus on relationship to the person, uh, not necessarily to the community. Uh, public health is really, as we know it today, is much more of a function of the last maybe 150, 200 years, where we tended to look more upon the, uh, the all of the people. And so we have ethical dilemmas. Uh, do you, let's take COVID, do you wear a mask simply to protect yourself or do you wear that mask to protect others? Uh, do you vaccinate yourself to present, prevent yourself from becoming ill or do you vaccinate yourself to also protect others uh, in the collective? And uh, this is where a lot of uh, uh, dilemmas have taken place because there's a lot of things that we do in public health that are meant not only to protect you, but to protect the larger group of people that you are a member of. Uh, rules about tobacco and where you smoke and can you smoke at a public place, for example. Uh, our our uh, examples of where we are protecting not only you uh, from being ill, but from those around you from becoming ill. Uh, now, uh, historically in pandemics, of course, and epidemics, the approach, whether it was the, uh, the Justinian plague or later plagues or what have you, uh, we were again focusing primarily on the person and not the group, though we did tend to blame groups. We tend to stigmatize groups uh, by their religion, by their uh, tribal identity and so on, uh, to say they were at fault. They caused this to happen. But uh, I'll, I'll end by, by saying that, that oaths have to constantly be uh, looked at and reevaluated. We are in an era now with this particular uh, virus that uh, the speed of, of information exchange is huge. The movement of people is uh, far greater than we have ever seen uh, through uh, uh, tra air travel and so on. The spread of information is far, far greater than we have ever seen in the past. And the development of technologies uh, so that we have gone from identifying the virus to uh, 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 defining it by its genetic code to developing a vaccine within six to eight months that's effective, all have occurred at, at almost warp speed, uh, which we have never seen uh, in the past. And therefore we have to adapt uh, uh, to this new reality because though it is interesting to study how we have dealt with uh, these kinds of dilemmas in the past, we are at a different point in time. We are at a different point in time, and we have to recognize that in terms of uh, our ethical principles and the oaths that we take. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Richard. And now uh, the floor to Natalia for, uh, uh, for comments. Thanks so much, Nicola. And let me echo the thanks from the beginning to Ambassador Papadopoulou for um, joining us in this conversation. And Mark, for your Remarks, you know, I have read the Hippocratic Oath a few times and I'm a proud Greek American, uh, but as director of the Center for Health and Human Rights, and as Richard said, you know, the focus of public health has always been about the society and what you elevated to me today is that the sick and this idea that, um, you know, do no harm, that it could be social harm, that we can think about the term injustice in that, um, in that phrase as injustice, not necessarily to one individual, but to a community. And I would love for us to sort of delve into that, that tension. Um, the other piece that I really found fascinating is this notion of accountability and who are we accountable to um, in a pandemic that we are facing today, which is hugely unjust, unjust within countries. And I should say that a lot of the work of the FXP Center has focused on inequities in mortality, inequities in who's getting sick, but also who's dying who is being impacted economically. And in this country, in the United States, it is predominantly uh, people of color, uh, low-income workers who were not able to, for example, work from home. But then obviously the global injustice is what we're seeing very much pronounced with vaccine inequities. Uh, right now, 70% of kind of high-income countries 
have people living in high income countries have received at least one vaccine, but the UN says that it's less than 15% in some of the lowest income countries, uh, including parts of Africa. And that's true, not only for the general public, but even healthcare workers. So this accountability, I, you know, if it is looking to the gods or looking to sort of our global collective injustice, who are we accountable to? Is it to the people who have been most impacted, sort of a, a bottom up accountability, or is there kind of a role for this moral, you know, revival in the conversation around what is just and what have we um, succeeded? You know, in, in many ways, there's a lot to applaud uh, for the medical professionals, for the public health, for the scientists who have brought us to a place where there is a vaccine, there are therapeutics, but there is a clear, clear injustice in terms of um, who has access to them. And, and I would love for us to, you know, to grapple with that a little bit, um, not to take us in an opposite direction from where we were, were going, but Richard, I also like the idea that you brought up around stigmatized groups, because we have seen that in this pandemic too. Uh, we have seen uh, people being blamed, whether it's, you know, refugees or migrants or Roma in Europe, or, you know, people of African descent in China for being kind of the vector. And it, it is interesting that while the Hippocratic Oath um, maybe didn't talk about kind of the environment, and I would love, Mark, if you can speak at all to the, the Hippocratic Corpus and this idea of the, the writings on airs, waters, and um, I don't even know the right term, on airs, waters, and places, which for a social epidemiologist like me is pretty fundamental to recognize that we as individuals, the disease is shaped by the environment, by where we live, by our exposures, and not only the, the environmental environment, meaning the water and the air quality, but also the social environment, the injustice in terms of who has access to, to wealth and benefits. And so if we can weave in some more of um, the Hippocratic corpus in this conversation, I would, I would love that because I think social epidemiologists do, do try to, to struggle between this individual, you know, how we embody disease and how we get sick and how as public health, we need to think about the context and the environment. And as Richard, said, prevent, prevent disease and, and community uh, patterns of disease. So those are sort of my big uh, points, but I'll, I don't know, Nicola, how you want to organize our, our conversation. So, so many things on the table, and I'm going to add one, uh, one more question from the public and, and one more. And so maybe we can do a second round and, uh, uh, and see where they lead us. Uh, the first question that comes from the public is very general, and I think speaks to uh, what we, we have been saying, and, and that is, uh, what changes would we make or how would we expand that oath um, in the current uh, context? It's pretty broad. Uh, the second one has to do with uh, what uh, Mark um, said in the beginning about judgment uh, and about uh, uh, medicine not being value uh, neutral. Uh, that reminded me of, of a couple of uh, debates that we've seen, first of all, about vaccines. Uh, ma many uh, people who said, well, um, how can we administer vaccines that are not tested enough? What should be the proper appropriate testing for that? And then on the other hand, uh, you have people like Didier Raoult in, in France who refused to do um, uh, studies with controlled groups. And the idea was, well, I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to provide care for the patient. I cannot tell my patient that, no, 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 wait, maybe you'll be in a controlled group if I think that the drug that uh, I'm testing might work, in which case I have to uh, provide care for that. But of course, the drug he had in mind is hydroxychloroquine, which then we found out doesn't uh, really work. Well, that's another story. Uh, but there was this, uh, uh, this kind of um, debate, um, ethics of care for the particular person versus um, um, scientific certainty, let's say. Um, I'm adding just this to the conversation and maybe we can have another another round and, and see what we what you think maybe Mark, okay. you well, should, should I um, just um, maybe yep. say some things and um, you know just to pick up on your point that you just raised um, about um, you know the ethics of, of vaccines and so forth I would just throw in um, you know, we tend to, and we should um, celebrate the rapid development of these vaccines. Something that I've never really seen discussed is uh, the impact on animals um, that um, would have been um, necessary for this. Uh, the kind of animal testing um, that was obviously essential uh, to um, the development of vaccines in this rapid time and, and the general assumption that 
I suppose um, the sacrifice was worth it. So I, I mean, that is a, an ethical issue that um, I think we often um, leave, uh, leave aside. Um, focusing on the human condition. And of course, the ancients uh, were not worried about um, animals uh, and um, their reactions. Indeed, there's a long tradition of animal vivisection in antiquity, which shows that to um, unfortunate um, clarity. But um, on the I would connect that, in fact, with this idea of our ethical perspective is always being updated, um, as, um, as uh, Richard mentioned, and it needs to be updated, and we need to update our thinking uh, based on changes in technology, changes in circumstances, and changes in uh, perspective. Um, we look back on the way animals were treated in antiquity, I think with some um, horror we can, uh, future generations may look back on us uh, with some horror at how we treat um, animals. So um, it, when we're trying to evaluate the significant, uh, significance of an ancient document like the Hippocratic Oaths, I think we need to have a certain moral clarity. Um, the oath mentions uh, the distinction between free and slave um, without um, any um, hesitation. Uh, that was, of course, a feature of ancient society. We have to have moral clarity about, um, about that, uh, but also realize that uh, future generations, um, as the oath indeed mentions here at the end, future generations will judge us um, for our moral perspective and may find us um, wanting. Uh, let me just respond to some of the other things that um, our other panelists um, have said. Um, on the topic of, um, of uh, you know, perspective and, and ethics um, changing with technology. Uh, I didn't mention one of the provisions in the oath, which is remarkable, I shall not cut even for the stone. Um, this is something that we can hardly um, uh, take on as, as part of um, medical practice today. Um, obviously, surgery has become a safe and, and effective component of, um, of medical care. Um, and um, you know, that's something that is connected to the specific circumstances of the origin of this uh, document. And it's not something that um, we're going to want, I think, to, um, as it were, carry, um, carry with us. Um, on the topic, uh, it's a very interesting um, issue. I, I thought about it a little bit. Um, the fact that the oath is, Hippocratic oath is focused on the individual patient physician um, interaction. And um, a lot of what we're talking about with COVID now is, is about uh, the individual and society and our, our obligations to others. And as uh, Natalia said, uh, that one, uh, the second clause that I mentioned, um, I will apply dietetic measures for the benefit of the sick according to my ability and judgment, I will keep them from harm and injustice, uh, can be construed as, as broadening the perspective. Um, I will uh, do my best to prevent um, medical uh, technology from being used for injustice. Uh, it is not clear exactly what the Greek means. It's a somewhat mysterious part of the document, but I think it does leave an opening for a kind of social justice perspective, even though it's quite right that the, um, that the relationship envisioned here is um, between the individual uh, physician and um, the individual patient. Uh, and questions of you know, one's obligation to others are not directly, uh, directly raised. I think if we were thinking about updating uh, the oath to be more specific to this public health perspective, we would add some, um, some things about that kind of, um, kind of reflection, um, no doubt, uh, since it is such, a, uh, such an issue uh, today. Um, all that being said, uh, there is a, a great deal of ancient medical literature in the Hippocratic uh, texts about the prevention of disease. Mm -hmm. Indeed, um, um, that is um, indeed uh, what a large number of the texts are about. How can we best uh, prevent disease through various uh, social practices, also dietetics, um, this mention of, of regimen in this clause, I will apply dietetic measures uh, for the benefit of the sick. Uh, dietetics was indeed uh, a part of ancient medicine that was focused on maintaining health as much as it was on, on curing health. So that um, aspect of prevention um, is, is lurking here in the background, although um, the document does not, um, does not directly um, address that. And um, perhaps um, you know, along those lines, I mean, the whole question of the environment uh, the role of the environment in health, 
in what the doctor is supposed to do is indeed a very important question in the Hippocratic uh, texts, not um, again directly uh, referenced in, in the Hippocratic Oath, but the text um, Airs, Waters, and, um, and Places, uh, which uh, Natalia uh, mentioned, uh, does uh, adopt a sort of public health uh, perspective uh, in that text, the itinerant uh, physician is imagined as um, going around to different cities and evaluating the environmental conditions that um, are going to be responsible for the breakout of certain diseases in the course of the year. So some cities are more healthy than others based on their geographical situation, based on their, um, based on their rivers, based on their lands and, and so forth. So that perspective um, is, is very much one that um, you know, the ancient uh, texts adopt. And indeed the historian of medicine, uh, Charles Rosenberg um, has, um, uh, uh, has written about the airs, waters, uh, places perspective or the airs, waters, places view where we step back from the biological um, uh, disease from you know, whatever um, you know, virus is causing uh, the illness and look at the social factors, look at the social environment, look at the, the physical environment um, and consider all of those. Because if we're trying to prevent something like COVID, of course, all those questions are also relevant um, and crucial, um, much more than knowing the, uh, the genetic cause uh, of the disease or the virus uh, that's, uh, I mean, it's equally, equally relevant. Um, uh, so we can talk more about the environmental perspective. It's, it's very much present. I would also just uh, add one uh, reflection, which was in the early days of COVID, um, I thought that our perspective was actually quite similar to that of the ancient um, doctors uh, in the sense that we had no idea uh, really uh, what was uh, governing this thing, how dangerous it was, what would protect us um, from it. I mean, we were told um, various things by experts, but they didn't really know uh, in that time and, and that was appropriate, science um, advances. But the uncertainty uh, that was prevalent in the early days, say March, April, May, um, 2020, uh, had us in a situation that um, you know, was not so different um, from pandemics in, um, in antiquity. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Natalia, Richard, do you have any? Go ahead, Natalia. All right, thanks, Richard. I mean, I think your last point about, um, yeah, the uncertainty and scientific advances and how, you know, knowledge is created and the role of doctors brings us into a completely different um, part of this Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors and public health experts have suddenly been in the limelight and political and politicized because COVID is so political. And, you know, the, this piece of judgment that there's individual judgments and that there's actually real debates even within the community around how to approach different questions, I think is important that people are people, but they're also representatives of a field that has now gotten some status. And, you know, that links a little bit to your point, Nicola, your question around, you know, the, the judgment value neutral and, and, you know, going back to this idea of do no harm, I wonder, I ponder on the question of do, you know, the status quo is, has clearly showed us that there are really, really deep rooted health inequities, right? So what exists right now is a system where some people have really healthy lives and many people around the world because of poverty, because of the conditions have really poor lives, you know, and live life where there's a lot more illness, a lot more, and, you know, COVID has not only exacerbated this, but also brought it to light. And so the question do, is it do no harm meaning, you know, is doing nothing when we see that the status quo is so unequal, is that part of the conversation? You know, is, you know, I, what I'm trying to get at is that oftentimes we, we think of, you know, if I don't do anything, meaning if I don't administer this vaccine or I don't administer this treatment, I haven't done anything, therefore I couldn't have harmed, but could the doing nothing be perpetuating this harm? And so this is a question that I think, you know, and I'll pass to Richard, who is really an ethicist. I think the role of, of public health in, you know, at times we're, we're kind of told that we are, you know, a nanny state or that we are oppressive or that we are, you know, when you put in place a quarantine, you're doing something that is quite, quite drastic. And, you know, is that, um, should that be allowed? Because we are doing something, but in the absence of doing nothing, 
it would bring about, you know, mass deaths um, and in, in inequitable death, you know, the people who were able to protect themselves would. So Richard, I feel like I'll pass it to you on some of the ethical dilemmas um, that I know you teach about too. Sure, thank you. Uh, let me just, uh, let me pull in a whole bunch of threads here. First of all, on stigmatization, uh, let us not forget that the country that was most stigmatized was China because, and uh, a lot of the anti-Asian uh, actions that we've seen in this country uh, relate to that, that somehow the Chinese were to blame for, for what we've seen. Uh, secondly, I think that again, uh, doing nothing, uh, yes, you could say, but the, the, the problem there is that not taking the vaccine, for example, puts others at risk. And, and that's one of the dilemmas that we have, have seen here. Uh, you may choose not to do something, but that means that uh, you can't interact with other people because you may put them at risk. Uh, thirdly, on the uh, whole issue of inequity, I think we need to be very careful here. Uh, we knew very early on in this outbreak, uh, I, I would uh, disagree somewhat with saying, well, we didn't know anything. We knew an awful lot. We knew that this was a disease that affected the very elderly. And those were the people who needed to be protected. This was not a disease of children or adolescents, frankly, anybody under 40 or 50 years of age. Yes, there are cases. Yes, there are tragedies. But the fact was, is that what was hollowed out here was an elderly population. Therefore, is it equitable to be sure that every country receives that 70% of their citizens get immunized? I don't think so. I think that if you look at the mortality, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a fraction of what it is in Europe and the United States and a number of countries of Latin America. Uh, I would not advocate immunizing everybody in, uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa because their demography protects them. They are very, very young populations and therefore the mortality and morbidity in those societies is going to be very low. Uh, the priorities should really go to those countries, rich or poor, because dead is dead, uh, rich or poor that have very high proportions of persons who are elderly. Ecuador, Peru got wiped out by this pandemic. Ghana, which is a country uh, not, uh, uh, not difference in their uh, population size or their uh, geography to some of these countries, uh, suffered one 20th, one 50th, the mortality. So I think we that uh, following science is very, very important because science told us who was vulnerable, who was not vulnerable, who had to be protected, who did not have to be protected. The great tragedy in the United States, for example, was that people who were at high risk of infection, that is, uh, as you pointed out, Natalie, who were poor, uh, who had to go to work, who were servicing our old age facilities, our chronic care facilities, people who were at high risk of infection were mingling with people of high risk of death. So you had a perfect storm. You had people who with high rates of infection mingling with people, treating them because they were their, they were their caretakers uh, with a very high risk of mortality. That's why I said earlier, we need to uh, constantly look at our ethical principles. And I think that uh, uh, as was pointed out by Mark, uh, the important guidelines in the Hippocratic Oath are how you behave as a person uh, of a particular profession, not the ins and outs and should you do this uh, in this situation or not, because those situations uh, are, going to, are going to be changing, uh, are going to be, uh, uh, it's a uh, Heraclitus, one of your other compatriots who said you can never step in the same river twice. And uh, uh, so ethics are going to change as, uh, as we develop cloning and, uh, 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 and other uh, situations that we are now facing. And that's what we have to be uh, uh, constantly aware of and where discussion and transparency is absolutely critical in a society developing and uh, 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 negotiating what should be the ethical guidelines that, and these are guidelines that uh, uh, affect us, 
not just as providers, but the general public as well, because these principles also refer to people and the decisions that they take in their own a role as someone who can give illness or prevent illness. It's not just the doctors who are doing it, it's the people who are under our care, the, 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 uh, the public who has to decide what they're going to do to help prevent illness in others. That's not simply a medical uh, decision, that's a public decision. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. I want to throw just one more question, which synthesizes much of, of what uh, I, I, I got from, uh, uh, from the public, uh, and then ask for your comments. And that has to do with, uh, actually, Richard, what you said about following science, uh, which has been a theme during this uh, pandemic, and the relationship between science and expertise on the one hand, and politics on the other. Uh, we, when we talk about social justice, or about expanding our ethical horizon, or about priority, uh, prioritizing the vulnerable or, or, or hum, prioritizing humans against uh, animals. Uh, it seems that science can give us facts. It can tell us, for instance, how much hum, uh, animal suffering is needed to provide for vaccines or how many people will die in X, Y, Z scenario and who. Uh, but then we end up with uh, a choice. And the choice, it seems to me at least, has to be political. Somebody has to decide. Uh, and at times, that's, that's a question for everyone. Uh, do you feel that we lacked a healthy public dialogue uh, and instead we were trapped into thinking that somehow some experts might give us the uh, answer uh, and, um, and, and somehow um, in, in ways that maybe they couldn't? Maybe I'll jump in, Nicola, with uh, my thoughts. You know, I think public health and health is political. You know, I think that's undoubtable. And while there is a debate, a healthy debate within the scientific community on how to be neutral, I think, as Mark said, you know, even from ancient times, it was recognized that it's it's not a neutral tool. You know, the assumptions that we make in the questions we ask, the assumptions and the, you know, incentives. And, and so I do think fundamentally science is political. Um, and allowing for that allows us to put on the table what our assumptions are, what are we you know, aiming for. In this COVID pandemic, we saw in the United States, for example, masks becoming really political. And that I think caught some people by surprise in the public health community. You know, it was like, you know, mask wearing is X and it became a sign and a public, it was so visual. Um, and I think, you know, different contexts in different countries, it was more or less. Vaccines have always in the last, you know, 20 plus years, I imagine, with, you know, the anti-vax community too, been um, really, and, you know, and I think what we haven't touched upon at all is what is science, what is knowledge, what is disinformation, mm -hmm. what is real debate within the scientists, because as Mark said, you know, the knowledge around COVID was constantly evolving. We didn't know some things, we knew some things, as Richard said, about who was most vulnerable, uh, but where does disinformation come in? I think the role of the public health community, what I'm really excited about why we're having this conversation is that in many, many of us, whether we're trained in public health or medicine, we don't talk history and it's very apolitical, the training. And so we're bringing together a historical lens and a political lens and the science together forces us to talk about some of these trade-offs. And in the end of the day, yes, the trade-offs, it will be a politician. And most importantly, it happens at different levels. At the local level, you may be making decisions about mass mandates, but it might be at the federal level that vaccine mandates. So some of the complexity also happens around who has the power to make the decisions. Um, but I'd say, you know, the conversations, I have seen many more public health and doctors become political because of COVID's impact. And I actually think that's a positive step, but I'm sure others disagree. Um, following on what uh, uh, Natalia said, I, it certainly is a, uh, the final decisions were obviously very political. Uh, I think one of the, when I said to follow the science, I mean those individuals who also interpret the science. I think some of the mistakes that made in this country and maybe others was the messages were not always clear. Mm -hmm. and, and scientists are not always the best people to deliver those messages. They're really, they make very bad uh, witnesses in court trials because the, uh, uh, opposing attorney says, well, is it possible 
<laughs> Dr. Cash, that somebody could have O.J. Simpson's uh, genetic makeup and, and, and the same DNA. And I say, well, yes, it's possible. Ah, so you say it's possible. Well, yeah, but the, you know, the, the chance is one in a billion, but it is possible, right? Oh, yes, it's possible because people working in the scientific field are uh, very rarely absolute because they recognize things can change. Now, how do you translate that uncertainty to messages which are very clear and which the public wants to know, should I wear, should I not wear, yes or no. Uh, and sometimes I think what happened is that scientists', scientists uncertainty uh, crowded in and made those who would take advantage of that uh, uh, a problem. So uh, I quite agree with you, Natalia, that it's ultimately a political decision. So how do you translate our scientific understanding uh, or our knowledge of something into a, uh, a message, uh, a communication, which people have then have to respond to. And I think that's a, that's a huge challenge uh, that all of us face because in the academy, we're always asking questions. That's, what, that's who we are. We, that's our DNA, so to speak. Uh, uh, we deal with uncertainty uh, and yet uh, within uh, decision makers, and I don't know what happened in ancient Greece. Did the did the uh, uh, did the senates uh, issue mandates or, or or not? I have I have no idea, Mark. So how did how did uh, ideas of Hippocrates or others get translated into what was then ancient Greek policy? They had to. They there had to be some mechanism for doing it. How was it done? Right. Well, uh, uh, yeah, on that uh, topic, uh, it's a very interesting problem um, because uh, if we think about the ancient Athenian context, uh, you know, Athens uh, in the fifth and fourth centuries uh, BCE was a democracy in a very strong sense, which is to say the citizen body, um, male uh, adults, uh, made decisions about the polity, uh, everyone directly. And so how you can actually implement um, something like scientific expertise, such as there was in the day, into public policy um, is, a big, um, is a big question. Now, somehow the Athenians managed um, to do it um, because you know, they built the Parthenon and so forth. I mean, this required uh, substantial expertise of, of certain kinds. Um, mobilization of resources, keeping of records, um, that kind of thing. How they were able to do it um, is, uh, is not entirely, uh, entirely clear. Um, it's possible that um, it depended on um, certain public slaves uh, for expertise, uh, that the, the polity was so radically egalitarian about knowledge that only those who were not members um, could have specialized expertise. Um, otherwise, it was a threat to um, the political um, equality of, uh, of the city. So there are very significant, um, significant issues um, with um, expertise and how it fit in to um, ancient, um, ancient democracy and other forms of, uh, of ancient uh, government. Of course, with Rome, we're dealing with the Senate, and so that's a very different kind of uh, scenario. Um, but, um, but yes, yeah, so I think that um, that's another area where the ancient experience is useful for uh, reflection on the question, who gets to decide about, um, you know, the implementation of things that are supposed to be for the benefit of everybody? Um, who is going to make that decision? Is it a group of specialized experts, um, be they members of the community or not? Um, or um, is it the community as a whole who decides on that question? Um, the Athenian um, experiment uh, attempted to balance um, both of those um, both of those things. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean the uh, the notion of following the science again, I think is, is quite interesting. I guess uh, we're we're nearing the the end of our conversation, yeah. but uh, I mean, Nicholas, do you? Um, I think we have, we have a couple of minutes. Yes, please. Yeah, well, I was just going to, to say that, I mean, this is a problem of demarcation. Um, you know, what is the boundary between what the science says and what the science doesn't say? And, and you know, as you say, uh, Richard, I think 
I mean, a lot of the problem comes from the fact that people are not aware that science is uncertain, right? I, I mean, science doesn't um, uh, give us deductive certainty about, um, about the world. Um, it gives us um, probability, sometimes at a very high level of, of reliability. Um, you know, it's a 99.9% .9 chance of such and such. But uh, greater awareness of that point, which I, I think is perhaps, I mean, a, a negative uh, uh, part of the legacy of the ancient Greeks, uh, the idea that science um, is demonstrative certainty, um, as we have in Euclid's geometry or something. Uh, this is another part of the, the legacy of, of uh, ancient Greece, which perhaps still uh, lives on in a, in a negative kind of, um, kind of form. So yes, I mean, uh, being aware of this, this uncertainty in scientific judgments uh, seems to be fundamental to the problems that, um, that we have had um, in communicating COVID discoveries and uh, procedures to the public. Thank you, thank you, Mark. We're slightly over time. So maybe Natalia, you wanna uh, um, say a few words of conclusion? Yes, thank as, you so uh, much. As FXB uh, partner. Thank you so much, Nicola. And, and let me start by saying thank you again to the Embassy of Greece, Ambassador Papadopoulou, but also uh, Connie Murtupalas, um, who helped organize tonight from the Center for Hellenic Studies. Obviously, the two of you, Mark and Nicholas, but also Ali Marby, Marbury and uh, Megan Daly from the FXB Center. And Richard, also a huge thanks from the Harvard School of Public Health for joining us today. I think what we tried to do today is a bit of an experiment, you know, breaking down this idea of who holds expertise. The expertise for something like a pandemic of COVID doesn't lie only in medical professionals like Richard or public health people like myself or historians and classicists that actually the challenges are so political and therefore bringing us together in a conversation, forcing us to try and speak the same language um, is what we experimented with today. And I hope the audience found it valuable. And you know, I wanna thank Mark specifically for walking us through the Hippocratic Oath in a way that wasn't just about the text, the literal interpretation of the text, but really the implications. And I come out of this conversation uh, echoing what Richard said, that the ethical norms and the technologies change, but actually having some agreement as a society of what those morals are maybe is a foundation for making some of those political decisions. And the question in a pandemic is that, you know, what is the society? Is it our globe? Because pandemics cross borders. Can we have these moral and social decisions at the local level? I mean, I think we're coming out of this with more questions than answers, but I hope this will be one of, of many interactions between history, the history of science, medicine, public health, and politics. And Nicola, thank you to you for moderating, for bringing us all together. And to all the audience, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.